Good morning, good afternoon or good evening, wherever you are in the world. I hope you're very well. You're listening to Autistic Voices on UK Health Radio. I'm Evelyn Charmer. I'm a paediatric therapist and I'm the director of Ed Elf Child Therapy Limited and its sister training company for therapists, the Child Hypnotherapy Institute. And I've recently been diagnosed autistic myself. So I'm very inspired to bring you a diverse and rich range of autistic voices from the community. People who are diagnosed, people who are not diagnosed, people who work alongside and collaborate with autistic families or autistic adults, people who identify as neurodivergent. Please come and join the conversation. I'd love to hear from you. You can email me at evelyn, that's E-V-A-L-Y-N-N-E at child hypnotherapyinstitute.com or contact me via the show. Thank you for joining me with Autistic Voices on UK Health Radio. Hello, 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 listeners. How are you uh, this fine, lovely December week? Um, I'm just going to go straight in and talk about gratitude, um, something that I like to start the show with, as you are aware. Um, So I'm really grateful at the moment for um, low-cost supermarkets. I'm just putting it out there because, you know, we were all aware um, that we're we're living in really challenging times of fuel poverty, um, amongst other challenges uh, for for individuals, for families. And um, I don't know about you, but I mean, it's it's a struggle no matter where you sit. I think, but particularly for people on low incomes, um, and people on on benefits and things, and people with with children, the the struggle is really high. Um, And no one should be in a position where they have to choose food over fuel um, and transport and those kinds of really difficult decisions. But that's where we are. So that's what I'm starting with today. Um, So I hope you're all well out there. A bit of an unusual show today on UK Health Radio um, because I am the guest of the week. I get lots of questions and lots of people asking me about um, working as a therapist with young people, children and young people and young adults um, who are autistic, ADHD, have OCD or, or, or in, in some way neurodivergent, diagnosed or not. Um, and also I get questions about the neurotypical um, children and adults I work with as well. So I thought, why not do a show that goes through some of the um, frequently asked questions that I I get. And so I can give you a bit more information on how um, Ed Elf Child Therapy, which is my my limited company, um, work with people who are neurodivergent. And also, uh, if you're out there listening and you're a therapist and you would like to work with children, young people, um, you can also come and talk to me about that because I do run some training. OK, so before I get into that, I. Um, I'm really pleased to uh, announce that UK Health Radio have got themselves onto all of the major podcast platforms. Well done for the team at UK Health Radio for organising that. So you can now tune in to us um, on any of those platforms. If you go to any of your favourite podcast platforms and search for UK Health Radio, all of the shows um, will be available on there. I'm going to start with um, some people um, find me on social media and contact me or by email and say, so Evelyn, how do you get ghost guests for the show and how do people get on the show? So I'll start with that one. Um, uh, this show is open to all. So although it's called Autistic Voices, you don't have to be autistic to be interviewed for the show. Um, the show is about discussing neurodivergence. And whether you are someone who's diagnosed neurodivergent yourself um, or you're someone who is undiagnosed, but you think you might be neurodivergent 
or you know somebody who is, or you're part of a family or a group of close knit um, people who you work with. Um, it doesn't matter if you're somebody who represents um, neurodivergence in the workplace. I've, I've talked to quite a few guests about that. If you're somebody who is neurotypical, but you want to come on and talk about your uh, views on neurodivergence or your experience of others, that's absolutely fine too. The show is open to all. So how do you get on the show? Well, first of all, you need to contact me and let me know. You can either find me on LinkedIn, Evelyn Charmer, and it's E-V-A-L-Y-N-N-E, Charmer, um, or you can email me, which is Evelyn, E-V-A-L-Y-N-N-E, at child hypnotherapy institute dot com. The process is that I tend to meet people first on Zoom for a quick chat, nothing recorded, just to talk about what you might want to talk about and how the show works. Uh, but basically, I record the show on Zoom. Uh, it takes about 45 minutes to an hour to do our interview. I, in our initial chat, we probably think about what you want to talk about and, and how best to get across what you want to say. And then I might email you some questions so you can prepare and then we do the interview and then once the interview is edited into the show with the music and the intro and the outro and all those bits and the ads I send it to you uh, for your final approval before we go to air so you do have control all the way through if there's something you say oh I didn't mean to say it like that or can you take that bit out or whatever then we can do that before it goes to air um, so you do have, you know, as I say, control of the situation. And if you change your mind and say, do you know what? I thought I wanted to do it. Now I've heard it. I don't want to do it. That's fine, too. So that's how you get on the show. Um, some of the frequently asked questions then I get about um, working therapeutically, specifically with neurodivergent children and young adults are why do neurodivergent children, and young adults need therapy? And sometimes people um, have got quite passionate about this, thinking that the therapy is about the neurodivergence. Well, I can clear that up straight away and tell you it's not. I'm in no way um, somebody who believes that neurodivergence is a, a problem to be solved or a deficit to be worked on or that it's a problem at all. And the way I see it is that... Um, a lot of neurodivergent children, young people um, really need support to help with getting in touch with who they are and living authentically in a neurotypical world in a way that makes them feel comfortable. So that's the kind of crux of it. Um, I don't approach people and say you're neurodivergent and therefore you need therapy. But as a result of being neurodivergent, a lot of children, young people really struggle with a number and variety of issues which they need support with in order to be able to become happier, basically, and develop what I call mental wealth and self-esteem. So that's what that's about. It's about self-acceptance, self-identity, awareness, and being able to overcome um, issues that might be holding them back from enjoying life and being involved in life in ways that they want to be and being able to be out in the world unmasked as much as they can be and as much as they want to be and feel completely secure and comfortable with that. So a lot of stuff goes into that. That's not um, a straightforward issue, is it? So I guess one of the things I get asked is, do you work to try to alter someone's neurodivergent profile or makeup. And I say, no, why would I want to do that? I'm also autistic myself. I was diagnosed with Asperger's before the um, di diagnosis criteria changed somewhat. So I'm now just known as autistic um, and I'm proud to be. Um, and I see a lot of strengths in that. There are challenges and I'm not going to pretend that it's all plain sailing or, or happy all of the time because it's not there are challenges and uh, my role as a therapist is to help neurodivergent people to overcome some of those challenges and to be able to really work with their strengths and their wonderful qualities okay i'm interested in helping people reach their potential basically moving on so um Sometimes people say to me, why do you choose to do therapy over a video 
link. So you're not in the room. It's not face to face with somebody. Um, so apart from the fact that means that I can reach more of you in more areas and there's no barriers to that. Um, what I've found is I have worked face to face for many, many years. I, I qualified as a therapist in 2002 and I have worked with people face to face the majority of the time. What I've found working online is particularly for people who are experiencing high levels of anxiety, um, low self-esteem, low confidence, um, stress, depression, and the reasons that they generally start therapy for, it's a much safer environment to access therapy in. It's safer in that they feel they can do it from their bedroom. They don't have to um, be in a clinical setting or some go somewhere and be on time and have the stress and anxiety of having to do that and relying on getting there in the car or walking somewhere or, or getting a bus or whatever. So it reduces all the sort of pre-session anxiety that can come with these types of appointments. Um, it also means they can access it whether they're in school, in college or at home. And I find that reducing those levels of anxiety is a really good starting point for building trust and rapport and being able to switch off the kind of fight or flight center of the brain, which um, when that, when we all know when we're in survival mode and we're in fight or flight or freeze, um, it's really hard to talk things through rationally or to access um, our wisdom, our inner wisdom and do anything other than be in survival mode. Um, so if somebody's starting therapy from that stance because they've had a really anxious time before they get to, even to the session, um, a lot of the session time can be taken up by bringing that anxiety down. Another thing that children and young people and in particular feedback to me is that they like the control of accessing counselling in a place they feel safe and being able to decide whether they want to be seen or not. So it works whether their camera is on or their camera is off. I work with a number of children who choose not to communicate verbally and there's a chat box so you can text type um, and there are other ways that they can access me even if they can just hear me which can be very therapeutic without the anxiety of feeling they have to be seen or heard they can also end the session no one's ever done that <laughs> but I always give them the option because I think actually if somebody's uncomfortable they should have the option to be able to end the session. Now, if if a young person was sitting in a clinical setting with a professional in a therapy session, can you imagine how difficult that would be to articulate, uh, I want to leave now, or I'm going to leave now, or just getting up and leaving? It's a really difficult thing to do. Um, there's, you know, I feel as though there's a bit of a power imbalance. Um, equally, I have worked in people's homes and schools. And again, there's a power imbalance because they feel like they can't tell you to leave. <laughs> so it takes away all of that. And I think it creates a more level playing field. Of We're here together. We're working collaboratively. We're working on video. But you can choose all of these options of how you communicate, whether you communicate um, and what you engage in. Um, and also... Another thing I like to give people is choices. And if um, I propose activities that I think are going to be valuable for that person, but if they are in a different headspace or they want to talk about something different or they don't like the activity, um, I've always got another, you know, endless number of, of uh, tools and resources that I can use at the tip of my fingers that can be more interactive and more engaging for somebody. So they're the basics. That's the reasons why I choose to work on Zoom. And I find that because of all of those choices, because of all of those controls that someone has, and that there's a clear time frame on um, them choosing to leave or not, 
at any point. It helps people feel more safe and comfortable to get into therapy. And that's what it's all about for me. UK Health Radio. The station that makes you feel good. The station that makes you feel good. Welcome back, listeners. You're listening to Evelyn Charmer on Autistic Voices. Uh, you might be listening to us on one of the major podcast platforms, or you might be listening to us on the UK Health Radio website, or you might be listening live. So however you're listening, I really hope you're enjoying the show. Um, bit of an unusual one if you've just tuned in, because my guest of the week is me. Um, I was explaining at the top of the show that I get asked a lot of questions about therapy. Um, for children and young people and neurodivergent people in particular. And I've been just going through some of the frequently asked questions I get so that um, you can get a better understanding of what therapy is and how it can work for neurodivergent people. Um, I'm always happy to talk through. So if you want to contact me, please do. And I'll always talk through things off show. Um, okay, so... One of the questions I get asked then um, is what do people need support with? What do people come to therapy for, particularly uh, autistic young people or young people who are diagnosed with a, a neurodivergence of some kind? And I would say, well, I think most people experience the same things, whether they're neurotypical or neurodivergent. But... Um, with the added layer of being neurodivergent, some of these things can be work, can be harder to 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 work through. But these are the things that I've experienced over the years that people, especially children and young people and young adults, need help with, um, who come to me. So anxiety, top of the list. No matter what the cause, and there's loads of reasons for anxiety. Uh, the majority of people who come to me are experiencing um, really high anxiety. And that can manifest in so many ways. And if you're out there and you're someone who experiences anxiety, you'll know exactly what I mean. Anxiety is different for everyone, but um, basically it's a survival mechanism which keeps us in that fear based um, fight, flight, freeze mode for longer than we need to be. And it perpetuates itself. So if somebody is anxious about something, they're more likely to get then preemptive anxiety about it the next time and anxiety can be soul destroying and so bad for our health physically mentally emotionally everything um, and it can be debilitating for people and people experience anxiety on a scale of you know fairly low um, anxiety to absolutely crippling and debilitating anxiety and anything in between um, and often what I find and I don't know if this resonates with anyone out there, but what I find is that people often feel really guilty about feeling anxious, like it's a really bad thing that they shouldn't be doing. Um, and they talk about it in a kind of, you know, like they blame themselves. Like, oh, I'm feeling really anxious and I shouldn't be and blah, 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 blah. So one of the things that I do work with with people a lot is helping A, to reduce anxiety but also to understand it and to really get to grips with why, what it is, why it is, and how to develop and manage it with coping strategies. Um, and alongside anxiety, a lot of people come who are experiencing very high levels of stress and stress responses to things, um, which feeds in. It's that they, they, you know, anxiety and stress are very closely linked, as I'm sure you're aware. Um Something else that comes to me quite a lot is um, OCD and OCD being a symptom of stress and anxiety. And it and it and people often say, well, it's controlling me and I need to control it or it's controlling our family. I don't believe in just treating symptoms. OCD is a symptom of inner stress. So if somebody's experiencing OCD, I do have a lot of um, work 
that I can do with them around challenging the OCD. Um, I've got a workbook I use from the South London and Maudsley Foundation Trust. But I find that if you treat the symptoms of something and you don't actually look at the underlying causes, that that stress and anxiety will pop up in another way. So I will help them to address the underlying causes. All of this stuff and life experiences Often people come with a um, really damaged uh, sense of self. And I also work with people on really de- developing their sense of self in a realistic way, which is strengths based, whilst also helping people to understand the things they find more difficult. Um, one thing I find quite often comes up is a real sense of perfectionism or fear of making mistakes. There's a word for a fear of making mistakes is, is what it is. And if it develops into a really phobic kind of set of symptoms, it becomes something called atelophobia, which I find interesting. A T E L O phobia. And um, di- that's a diagnosed phobia, but even if it's not diagnosed, a lot of young people who I speak to who are autistic or ADHD or multiple, you know, um, set of neurodivergencies um, often really do struggle with um, the idea of getting things wrong or not getting it right or making big mistakes or being shown up to not have got it right. And they, they, they're really consumed by that and that people will think negatively about them and they will think negatively about themselves if they don't achieve other things people come for are, uh, and, and also alongside, because often people come with all of these things, they're not often just siloed on their own, uh, is difficulty with relationships and friendships and understanding people's motives and what people mean and trying to work out what people mean and how to develop um, friendships that are either working on one level and not getting any deeper or finding it really difficult to find where you fit as a young person in the in your peer groups and understanding those kinds of uh, all the social nuances that go on and can happen. Um, I call it social engineering, um, being able to really navigate through what is a really complex system. And um, we're living in a world of social media, aren't we? So those navigating those social systems carries on continually. 24 seven, there's no escape from it. Um, and that's something that comes up a lot. Processing that comes up a lot. Processing, processing things that happen, processing things that might happen, processing transitions and change, processing, um, emotions, feelings, processing events. You know, there's a lot of processing of sensory experiences that people need to do. So sometimes just having a safe space to come and just talk things through, getting the thoughts out so that you can start to look at them externally a little bit, a bit more objectively and start to process them, put them all back together in your head. Uh, another thing that I work with is um, helping people just on a um, executive functioning level, just being able to plan, organize, prioritize, work out time management, just on a really practical note, being able to think through um, action planning, you know, how do I get from here to there? How do I make this happen? How does that happen? I call it reverse engineering. I like this word engineering because it is, it's all about um, constructing things, isn't it? From an idea to, to fruition. So even if it's how do I get to you know, become more independent, which is a great big thing to reverse engineer, um, down to I want to meet up with a friend and go for a pizza, you know, working out the steps and what needs to happen and who needs to be involved in that um, and what sort of skills you might need um, to develop or, or, or that you've already got that you can use to put these things in place and make things happen. Sometimes that's really helpful for people. So that's a kind of snapshot if you like, of the types of things that people come with. Um, There are others, you know, there are things like IBS and bedwetting and various other things that come. But I guess really for me, most of it comes down to anxiety and stress, um, even when it is about bedwetting. 
and IBS. So, you know, there are a number of things that people come for, sleep issues. What does, you know, when I come, and then that comes down to usually often, <laughs> um, if there isn't a medical reason for a sleep uh, disorder or anything, it can come down to stress and anxiety, you know, um, and low self esteem and self worth. So they often all come down to the same things. So I hope that's answered that question, um, as to what people need help with. And it's not about, we need to change somebody because they are neurodivergent. This is about helping people to develop skills that help them be themselves in the world in a more authentic way and feel generally happier and mentally wealthier. Okay. Um, I'm going to have another break now because it's really weird, I'm sure, just listening to one person talking when you're used to me interviewing someone else. But I think it's really important that we cover these topics today on a health show. And we haven't really done that over the last few months that Autistic Voices has been on. So UK Health Radio. The station that makes you feel good. The station that makes you feel good. Welcome back, listeners. I hope you uh, enjoyed a bit of Luther Vandross or went to make yourself a cup of tea if it's not your, well, cup of tea. Um, thank you for listening to Autistic Voices. The Autistic Voice of the Week is me. I've got to say, actually, the day this show is coming out, I will be in Leeds receiving a Yorkshire Prestige Award for Ed Elf Child Therapy Limited. I've actually, I'm really proud of this. Um, and I've won Children's Holistic Therapy Clinic of the Year 2022-2023. So I am incredibly proud of the work that all of the children and young people and young adults I've worked with have put in to make that award happen, really, because if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be Holistic Children's Therapy Clinic of the Year. I'd just be me, wouldn't I? Therapy is, is a collaboration that is done between people. It's not done to, it's done with. And so for all of you out there, if you've been one of my um, precious um, young people or you've been one of my precious adult people um, over the last few years, I just want to say a big thank you for what you've done in developing Ed Elf Child Therapy Limited into what it's growing into from a little acorn mighty oaks we may grow and a real reward for all of those people, including uh, me and any future therapists who come to work alongside me. Um, I have some people coming on board who are being trained through the Child Hypnotherapy Institute, which is uh, the training arm of Ed Elf. And I can't wait because that means widening the reach again uh, across various regions over the coming couple of years. So look out for that. OK, and next frequently asked question then. Um, this is about um, hypnosis in, in particular. So lots of people worry about hypnosis and hypnotherapy and about hypnotherapy with children um, and about hypnosis as a, you know, is it a control mechanism and can it take over someone's mind and can it make someone do things or change things or mess with their brain and all of those. And I think they're very valid questions. And when I trained in 2000, the two, early 2000s in hypnotherapy, um, I probably would have been as wary as well, because my only experience of hypnosis was um, stage hypnosis. When you experience it, though, it's not like that at all. So stage hypnosis and hypnosis for therapy are very different. Um, hypnotherapy is a really relaxing technique which helps people to get into what's called theta brainwaves. Um, if you're someone who drives a car or a bike or a motorbike, um, when you're driving somewhere, your brain's working on theta because you're kind of you're conscious of what you're doing, but you're able to then if you if you're someone who's driven for a while anyway, and you're not just learning, you're not thinking about everything you're doing. It's become a subconscious thing, hasn't it? It's become part of you. Um, so really, hypnosis is about helping someone's brain to switch down into theta. And when you're in theta, you're um, subconscious mind, which is where all of your fears and beliefs um, and experiences are kind of stored like a library, um, is more open to 
listening to positive suggestions that can help you change unhealthy or unhelpful um, thoughts, um, <clears throat> feelings and, and behaviours. So it's very much, again, a collaborative thing. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, a very young child I was working with um, was um, a brilliant gymnast and she had her very first um, <clears throat> accident. She didn't harm herself. No one was harmed, but she she shocked herself that she had fa failed or, you know, made an imperfect move and she'd, she'd ended up falling. And not surprisingly, listeners, that absolutely knocked her confidence hugely. And she was very scared to go back onto that piece of equipment. And yet she really... Her, I see it as kind of the mind and the soul. So her mind was saying, this is dangerous. <laughs> this can go wrong. And her soul was saying, well, I love being a gymnast and it's what I want to do. So she was in conflict with herself. Do you understand? Um, and I worked with her and her mom and she was very much on board, this little girl. And um, did some CBT, which is cognitive behavior therapy, which helped to think about her thoughts about what happened and her feelings about what happened and how it was affecting now her behaviors and, uh, um, and how she was more scared now and how that was manifesting for her. Um, and we also had some, um, CBT around imagining that fear as, um, a character that had just popped up in her life and she could face it and tell it to go away if she wanted to. And we created some really nice hypnosis where she chose um, a place where, to go to in her brain, in her mind, where she felt really happy and really safe and comfortable. She chose Disneyland. Um, and we, so when, when I put her into theta waves by relaxing her, reducing her breathing, helping her to get into a nice relaxed state of mind and taking her mind back to a place in her case, Disneyland, that she felt really safe and happy and really comfortable and confident. Um, and then telling her subconscious brain that she was able to overcome her fears and that she was a good gymnast. It was okay to make mistakes. Um, that she can overcome that and she can tell the fear to go away and continue her journey as she wants to into, you know, with her gymnastics. And of course that worked for her. Um, amazing. So that's just a little example of how hypnotherapy can really help. And uh, another thing it can do is simply just reduce anxiety by taking someone into a relaxed state of mind. Now, not everyone likes to be hypnotized or wants to do that and not everyone feels like it works for them and that's fine too it's just another tool in the bag so as a pediatric hypnotherapist it's something I will use if it's appropriate if it's agreed if the child consents if the adult parent responsible for the child consents and um, I'll also always do a kind of taster session and someone can say, you know, that worked for me brilliantly. I loved it or mm, don't think that was going to work for me. And that's fine too. So I just want to put that out there, that um, it's another tool in the bag. I'm a big believer in strength-based approaches, which means thinking about pe developing people's strengths and skill sets and also bringing their awareness to what their strengths and skills are. Um, very solution focused, which is about thinking about, um, how to, you know, how life will be when the problem is solved, really. What's, what's, what's life going to be like? And also using things like zones of regulation, you might have heard about protective behaviors, which is about personal safety awareness and being able to, um, articulate to, to understand your own early warning system that tells you when there's danger or risk and being able to manage that. Um, and also a combination of that with, cognitive behavior therapy so people say how do you do it how do you do it what do you do what do you actually do um now over the years i've developed a kind of system of working that i stick to pretty much and and i do work within this in terms of i'm very fluid and very intuitive and instinctive with people so i might not i don't follow a set program but I try to cover um, a variety of uh, areas that people often need support with. Um, I've developed a program called Congruent Me. And congruent, for those that don't know, just means authentic. So Congruent Me is about developing people um, to 
be authentic and to develop self-acceptance and self-love, really. Um, so the congruent stands for the C is about community. We all need to know our place in community. We all need to know that we're worth something. We have value and that we are, you know, we where we are with within our peer group and things like that. So I do lots of work around that. O is for ownership and accountability. So being able to um, separate what is your own beliefs and your own thoughts and your own feelings from that, that been, those that have been given to you by others and being able to own how you feel and be able to state it and stand in your power um, and take responsibility for yourself, you know, in terms of that, in terms of saying, I need these needs being met and I'm able to now say them. So I do a lot of work around that, depending on the age of the young person, of course. Um, the N in congruent me stands for networks of support. So being able to really work with someone to think about what do they need from leaders, leaders being parents carers professionals you know and also how to sort of really work out friend from foe and what is it that makes somebody um in your network um uh, somebody you want in your network and why um which leads into um working on goals and solutions for problems that arise um developing healthy relationships so the r stands for relationships Look, I help people to look at their values and, you know, work out what their values are. And so how to seek that in others and how to know when somebody's not somebody who's adding that value to your life and in, and in tune with you and how to be able to be a good friend as well and to be able to do that for others. Um, the you is about understanding and, and sometimes children, young people have subconsciously taken on board the idea that being neurodivergent is wrong or there's something bad about it or they're, they're, they are deficit in some way or they are not good enough or not the same as. And so I do some work with children and people about that self-awareness and understanding of themselves, which helps them say, oh, OK, so I get that. I, I understand more about what my strengths are and I understand more about what my challenges are and what my needs are and how to get them met and how to ask for them to be met. Which leads into the E, emotional literacy and empowerment, being able to express what you need and also who you are, how you're feeling. And sometimes it's really hard to do that. So I do lots of work around um, being able to get in touch with feelings and emotions and being able to articulate them. And last but not least, T for building trust and rapport. So that's being able to trust yourself, trust your own inner um person and your own inner voice and your own inner feelings and being able to articulate them but then being able to build up trusting relationships with people who can support you to develop and grow and be able to get your needs met and all in all that congruent me kind of model whether I work with all of those things or partly work with some of those things is something that I find really helps somebody on a holistic way which is looking at all the aspects of their life and if you do that with someone um, in a non-judgmental, supportive, caring, loving way, I find that people find self-acceptance, self-awareness, self-love, and are able to be in the world in a more authentic, congruent way. And that is the crux of the work of Ed Elf and why of one children's holistic therapy clinic of the year, I guess. OK, I think that's it from me. Um, I hope that you've enjoyed listening to all of that. And um, please like, share, whatever you can do to or subscribe to the podcast. Um, tell other people about it. And if you want to get in touch with me to discuss anything that I've talked about on the show today, including coming on the show yourselves, if you want to talk about a topic, then please get in touch with me. I'm just going to clarify that email address I gave you at the top of the show. Let's see. It is Eva Lynn, E V A L Y W N E, at Child Hypnotherapy Institute dot com. And I'll see you when I see you. Have a good week, everybody. Thank you for listening. Um, you're all fabulous. Thank you for listening. I'm Eva Lynn Charmer. This is Autistic Voices on UK Health Radio. And special thanks to our guest of the week.